Hi, my name is uh, Carlos Coronado and we're going to talk today about accessibility uh, in first person games. But first, a little bit about... So, who am I? I am a solo indie game developer and I've done many, many games. Usually all of them uh, first person except for Coral. And as you can see, I've released many games at many, many systems and, and consoles. I like right now I'm developing the Horror Tales saga, the first game uh, which is uh, Horror Tales The Wine, as you can see in my webcam, has already been released. It's been a huge success. And right now I'm developing the second one in the saga, which is Horror Tales The Beggar, which it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, aside from this, I do also teach in the game design and uh, game development in the University of Barcelona and you can find me in a daily basis in my Twitch channel because I actually uh, I show the, the entirety of the development of my games. I am when I'm developing my games, I'm doing it also on Twitch. Um, I think it's an awesome experience because it allowed me to connect with other game developers and it's also a great tool to learn game development if you're a student or you want to see how sh shits are done. So yeah, that's another way you can reach at me and of course via Twitter. Okay, so let's start. Let's talk about the Horror Tales saga specifically, but this is something that it's not accessibility for uh, horror, first person horror games. It kind of works for everything because when I started the Horror Tale Saga, I knew it was going to be a trilogy and I developed something called the Nina template in honor of my cat Nina. And uh, and it's like a template or a framework which includes a lot of accessibility features that can work in almost any first person game that you develop. And the funny thing is sometimes uh, we think about accessibility, about an and we think about an accessibility menu in a submenu in the main menu system. It does have that, but I am not here mainly to talk about that because I think that the, the accessibility features that are more interesting are the implicit ones. And don't worry, we're going to see all of them. But yeah, it's important that we not only think about accessibility in terms of the accessibility menu. It's something border. And actually, if you take into consideration accessibility at the beginning of the project, it's going to be much easier later on to add accessibility features. If you're trying to make a game more accessible that it's not thought that way by default, it's going to be a pain in the ass. So, yeah, uh, there are some like certain rules in first person game design, so to speak, that are perfect and shared across all first person games and mainly these are things that we're trying to avoid and things that encourage a good experience for a first person experience so one uh, one implicit feature of accessibility and again there's a very very thin line between good game design and accessibility because sometimes they even merge and you don't even realize and the first one is super clear, good visual and audio feedback. What this means is the player should know how can he or she interact with the world. And he should, uh, the player should know too what things can be done and what things cannot be done. And it's very important to, to get a system so the player knows how to interact with the world. So, for example, um, if I have a game and I want the player to interact with some paper, uh, a letter or whatever, how do I teach the player you can interact with that paper? Maybe an outline, maybe an audio cue, maybe a two-day sprite that follows the paper on screen when I'm at a certain distance. And this is very important and we will see examples of that in the future. Of this talk but uh we're it's sometimes this is something that it seems obvious but it's actually divided into sections we have to tell the player 
we have to communicate to the player, is this something I can interact with? And if it is, how can I interact with? For example, I really like the outlines. An outline, when I approach something, I draw an outline into that something, and it's like, and it communicates to the player like, hey, you can interact with this. But it doesn't show anything in the screen like press E to interact or whatever. Then when the player approaches that object and is within a certain range defined by me and looking the object, then I say press E to interact. So it's not only the press E to interact because we cannot assume that the player is going to be looking at everything in the center of the screen to interact. You have to communicate that there's something there you can interact. And that's why it's very important that you communicate it in two ways. Hey, there's something nearby you can interact with, the outline. And hey, there's something right on you that if you look directly at it and you are in less than whatever distance to it, you can press E or whatever to interact. That's super important to make this, the two distinctions because if you only do the second one, most players won't even know there was something there you can interact with. Uh, I'm going to talk about the next one very quickly, language selections. This is kind of obvious, right? Uh, a game with more languages is a game that uh, can be played by a border audience and therefore it's more accessible. Language selection is, is a funny one because uh, for the way I organize it in my games, I always have like two spreadsheets for localization. One is the spreadsheet for, you know, like the menu, the accessibility features, the things that are not the game itself. And I have another one for the game lore. And I think this is important to make because imagine that you add new content to the game, new area, new DLC, whatever, I don't care, or a new feature, for example. So it's it, you're going to find yourself in a tight spot for if you actually localize the game to a lot of language, which I really encourage you to do. Because what is going to happen is, okay, so I want to update the game, but I'm finding myself now with the game uh, in all these languages, except the new content, which is only in English or English or, or Spanish or Catalan or your mother language or whatever. And that can suck us. There's not an easy solution, but I think that for the sake of game development, it's very important to not, especially if you're an indie one, to not have all the localization ready because if you have to wait to, for every uh, localization language to be ready for the new content, it can be a lot of time, especially if you're an indie developer. So you have to find a way to do something like the fallback languages. For example, in my game, if uh, I update the game and the new text is not available in the new language in the for example let's say french in french it fallbacks to english you don't get a blank whatever and i th i know this seems kind of obvious and outside of the realm of first person game design but i also think it's important to just you know just talk about it the next one is uh, menu navigation it doesn't have to be also something only for first person games but please do your menus navigable with gamepad right from the beginning of the project too. It's much more time consuming to adapt a menu that you're thought to be doing with uh, only keyboard and then doing the gamepad controls than to, than to do a menu with by default both gamepad and keyboard and mouse. It's just like that. And it's not only that, like it's preferable if you have also a pause menu, uh, <coughs> Dark Souls, <coughs> or, or some way to, you can access the main menus in games or something by default that you can do that. But yeah, a good menu navigation, it's also a good accessibility feature. And you know, when people play the game, there's a necessary menu, but most of the people are going to go to the menu and the first time they're going to click new game or play or comments or whatever. And make that button really available from the beginning. Don't put the play button to start the adventure or start the game or whatever hidden in 20 submenus, please. Like that button should be like 
pump right at the beginning. The menu is something the player uses uh, to tweak the experience of the game or to navigate to a certain part of the game, but don't hide the play button. It's, it's, it, it is the most important button in, in your menu, and if you can put it in no submenu, that's, uh, that's great. I don't do that because my game actually saves uh, the progression of the player, and I have a little submenu that we're going to take a look at it in a moment, but you'll see that it's it's not that e that difficult to reach. Okay, then the game loop navigation. The game loop navigation, it's also a really important one because it talks about not only how the player progress from the menu to the game, but what happens when you leave the game, where are the credits, do I show some... some uh, studio logos or names or whatever before or after the main menu at the beginning of the screen uh, how can i interact with the other menus how do i progress through the game from chapter to chapter how do i select chapters and this is something i also do for all my games and all my chapters are uh, unlocked by default and this is something i do because what if i just want to take pictures in the video game. All my games include a photo mode and I think that it's pointless to hide the counter behind a progress barrier or imagine that, I don't know, my game fails got corrupted. Um, it's not a problem. You go to the chapters menu and you select the chapter and it's not look at chapter or whatever. You just go to the... And I know that uh, a lot of people are not thinking like, Oh, but Carlos, what about the achievements? What about the people who, um, I don't know, get an achievement to 100% of the game? First of all, if you want to make sure that someone played the game from start to finish, you have ways to, to, to look for that in your achievement manager coding or whatever. But fuck the achievement people i like i hate achievement so much uh, they add a lot of work to game development and they don't actually make the experience better in any meaningful way and sometimes uh, we have to you know even think for filler counter because the game loop you've thought it's not something that you can adapt to have like 50 achievements or whatever and yeah, my, my advice will be like, don't take achievements into consideration of the design of your game because it's going to be painful. And then we have the immersive features. And the immersive features, uh, don't worry, uh, we're going to look at all of this in-game. The immersive features are very important too. And uh, th these are features to make the first-person camera more immersive in the game area. Like, for example, when you zoom and, and you land, maybe you want to play a little camera animation. When you get hit, maybe you want to play a flashing red screen. All, all that stuff that we're going to take a, a look in in a moment. But I think it's very important to have them well thought from the beginning because some of them can ruin the experience for most players. And then, of course, we have the explicit accessibility features, also known as the accessibility menu, that we're going to take a look at it in a moment. Okay, and this is the things that we want to avoid in almost all first-person games. And, of course, what we want to avoid is dizziness, disorientation, unclear ways to interact with the world, as we have seen before, glitchy movement, and clunky menu navigation. Okay, dizziness and disorientation, these are easy, like usually you want your first person controller to be as smooth as possible, to not have a lot of, of you know, don't take the control of the camera away from the player to, to introduce a cinematic or something in a very heavy way, don't do... Don't uh, try to make levels that are very easy to read in terms of na navigability so the player knows what's up, what's done, what's in front or whatever. Or if you are going to do something abstract, uh, 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 at least think and have in the back of your mind that uh, this environment can be disorienting to the player and that can suck too. And we've talked already about unclear ways to interact with the world. And the glitchy movement is something that uh, I find my students most of the time don't take that into consideration. All first-person games has have more or less glitchy movement in in some way, but the, the key rule here is that 
This is something we are trying to avoid as much as possible. So for the glitchy movement, I'm talking, for example, the player stepping in something that it's like, I don't know, 20 centimeters or 10 centimeters tall, and then the camera goes like, pum, does a quick jump 10 centimeters up in the air. That little jump is, oh, it's the worst. There are, there are many, many ways to avoid that. I work in Unreal Engine and you can uh, tweak the uh, movement template of your pawn or your charter and it's going to be okay. You just do more step, more angle where the player can go, but that has its own challenges because now the player suddenly will jump towards uh, something that it's big and you don't want that there's it, it is a switch is this is a sweet spot it, it's something you have to tweak uh, for your game another thing i really encourage is, is like uh, stop making the player fat by default the first person capsule of unreal engine it's a very big capsule that means the player won't fit indoors uh, or in normal sized doors I, I strongly recommend that, that you make the re radius of the capsule a little bit thin and that way the navigability of the wall is going to be uh, uh, more, more awesome for the player. And of course the clunky menu navigation which we are going to see also in a moment. Okay, now that we've talked all of this, let's get to the game. And let me change the screens. Let me put that here. Let me open the game. Oh, and the first thing it's uh, it's this one actually. We are we are here, and this is the crates I show before the menu. And this is what I'm talking about. Play, continue, pam. Then I'm playing. I like to put very ugly uh, loading screen text. And now I'm writing the game, but this actually falls because I can actually go to the game much faster if I just spam uh, whatever key. For example, now I spam the space key and pam, 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 continue, pam, I'm in the game. Just like that. Just like that. This is super important for me. This is something that uh, it's, uh, it's going to be very very important for the experience like the, the menu should not be something the player is fighting and that's it's something very 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 important to communicate to the player okay so now i'm going to exit to the menu so you can see it's quick it's not a pain in the ass and i'm going to click new game or chapters testing which is the the first level and as you are going to see now we are in the starting area, okay, the player starts uh, looking like that. And we have the first communication of interactivity. You see that green outline? There's, hey, I can interact with this. Then I, if I look at it, then a little text appears in the bottom of the screen. Sorry if the subtitles are here. But if I click A, then something happens. In this case, it's like it's just communicating to you the information of what you need to do in the game. Uh, but, but, and that's the interesting part of it, if I continue just a little bit, now we have the tutorials of mouse rotate, and this is very important, actually, I didn't talk about this in the presentation, but you see, like, mouse, move, mouse, rotate, and actually, if I restart again, let me do a new game and skip the lore, because why not? You'll see now that the first thing that we communicate to the player You'll see in a moment. Is absolutely nothing. And when we go here, it's like maybe like the player knows like the movement. This is a game thought to be thought in a gamepad. But you don't really want to make a first person game only playable for people that knows already how to play a first person game so if you can communicate to the player press this to move press this to crouch the crouch tutorial is way up for example this is the first game that the player actually needs to turn the camera to progress through the game and this is where i i would teach them the player how to do that and uh well here it disappears but it is something very interesting now 
and it's about the way the player can communicate with the world and how the accessibility can actually make the game uh, the game design easier for the player. So, for example, when you arrive here, this seems like a barrier, and suddenly pop. Oh, I don't know if you've realized that, but this bottle kind of uh, become glowy, and glow in game languages you can interact with that. And this is this I actually use it to lure the player towards there, and because I want the player to not look at this exit right away. And when I approach the bottle, now the text become glowy, and this is actually distance. These are box triggers that I can actually tweak to 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 make the experience more interesting because now the player is 100% focused or that, that's what I hope on this little tunnel over here this is an empty bottle uh, the game has asked you to find a full bottle this is some lore whatever but it's like here uh, this bottle I, I don't want to put this bottle here because sometimes the players just went like this and they didn't realize there's a wall area here and when do they do like this and they turn with the light and the bottle, it's impossible to see. And this is all, all, all objects to lure the players towards here. There's the, the glow in the door, so you can see you can interact with the door. Show this whole tutorial. That's like a prominent bottle. Oh, and that seems an intact bottle. It's just an empty bottle, whatever. And uh, if the player has already reached here, he's probably going to explore a little bit more to see what's going on. And we come here, there's a paper here, whatever, more lore. Okay, so this is a dead end. What a shitty game. Oh my god, I have to return. Where do I go now? Whatever. Bam. And then the first uh, jump scare or, or meaningful scary situation of the game happens. And this is all done through accessibility. This is all done, this is all achieved through the glows. These are the, the glows are the most important part of this scare because... The player now he thinks, okay, I have to go back, I have to go quick, and bam, this is when the the very juicy content happens. And again, uh, sometimes good game design is good accessibility. When the player gets out and looks here, it's very easy to see that, oh, there's a gap here. So you go here and you continue the exploring the, the adventure. You can run. This is the run tutorial. I give plenty of space to the player to see how he can run and if we continue just a little bit more i've done this like a hundred times this is the the crouch tutorial as you will see now we see this control crouch because sometimes people won't know or won't realize that you can actually crouch in the game right so this is the 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 way to communicate that you can interact with something is like this if I look at this from here, I cannot interact, but maybe the player thinks this is a threat zone. He cannot interact with this. So we communicate it through the glow, and then I approach, and when I am in the interact range and I am looking at it, I just interact and do whatever I, I have to do, and I don't know. Okay, uh, so this is super important. And when we're talking about immersive features, we're also talking about this. I don't know if you realize I'm going to go back at the beginning. No, here it's happening. Uh, uh, do you realize that the camera is actually going up and down? The camera is it, it's very, very, or, or this black uh, thing while, while I'm running. But the camera, when I'm running especially, you see in the top of corner of the screen that it has a very, very subtle movement. That can be this, something that destroys the experience for everyone playing the game and it can potentially make some someone dizzy so it's no problem we go to the accessibility menu and there's an option for that which is the camera shake it's on we put it off and now there's no camera shake whatsoever for anything nothing gets camera shake even with a jump i think this is a very a very bland camera but uh, if you don't give the, the player the option to deactivate this uh, this kind of behavior for the camera, it's it's it can have the potential to screw the experience for a lot of players. And now that we have that unactivated, I want to step on this to see because this is a bad example of accessibility right in the beginning of the game. Look what happens when I go uh, up this. It's like clank, clank. It's like this 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 step right here. You see the camera which it's doing something glitchy or, or here it's like pam pam 
I'm bumping in, in this little thing and this this should have the collision disabled because even if I'm if I encroach it's not something I I I I, I pass I, it, it should have been disabled because the camera is doing some very weird things and we don't we don't really want that uh, right now let's see how I have uh, only five minutes left okay let me explain then uh, a little bit about the accessibility menu of course if you're making first person games please oh, subtitles always on by default that's for me it's a must then we have the text size we can make the text bigger or smaller of course the gamma it's just the brightness but invert invert the it's very important very very important and the, for example let, let me just put this exaggerated let me put the cross scale style i'm going to be a giant contrasted outline style let's go to huge rotate sensitivity this is the most important setting in a first person game huge rotation rates are going to make some players dizzy just put a rotation rotate sensitivity slider in your game even to go up or to go down this is a lot of players go, are going to bad review your game on steam if you don't put this this slider this is the, the bare minimum I have an option to disable flashing light because it's a horror game we're, talk, we're going to talk about immersive mode later on but i can also change the text style and there's a little 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 example text about how the in-game texts are going to look um if the player could actually tweak uh, the color or the opacity it would be better i mean in the game developer i don't have the time to do that <laughs> but now you can see like this big uh, center of the screen which is also i strongly encourage in all the first person games uh in now if you see the, the glows are gigantic and the text is gigantic too or whatever you can see like the text auto adapts to the screen Maybe it's a little bit good, don't worry, but it should not do that, but whatever. Ah, and something, you can actually read the text here, because now I'm going to make the game less accessible. I'm going to go to the accessibility menu, I'm going to reset the settings. Okay, I'm going to go back, and you see this little crosshair in, in the center of the screen. It's it's very subtle, but it, something like this by default really helps a lot of people with the game. But take a look at this. If I go here... You have two texts, the in-game text, which is also localizable too. If I go to settings, language, let's put it in Catalan, and we go back. Like all the text, the in-game text on the paper sheet and the text in the hood gets localized too. Maybe it takes a little bit to, to propagate the change, but whatever. That's very important too. Not, if you are going to use like some fantasy or handwriting or whatever, make the option or put the text uh, normal text to the player in the screen that's something that i think it's really important too but and i'm going to finish with that because we've been talking all this time to about making the game more accessible but i'm going to i'm going to actually do the opposite now what about if we want to make the game less accessible for the player also known as more realistic or whatever please leave that option to your players too for example if you go to the accessibility menu let me put this all by default and then we okay let me put it back in english and then we're going to outline style invisible crosshair style invisible and we are going to activate the activate the immersive mode and with these features now no outlines and no screen text so it's going to be see what it's not working why is it not working <laughs> it should be working uh, 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 it got changed invisible invisible mercy mod yes thank you i don't know what i click there see now no text only a little audio cue that you're not going to hear okay and now i just grab the paper no text no whatsoever no outlines no nothing and there are some people that they they, they do want to use the accessibility menu or uh, use the accessibility features to make the game less accessible because they want the full 100 realistic experience or whatever 
please allow them to accessibility is there for these kind of players too and i think that's uh, this is a wrap up i have some ex specific accessibility features for this game but these are features that are only sp uh, specific for this game i have i don't have a uh um how do you say i don't have a feature per se to make the game less difficult but i do have a feature to deactivate the enemies in some areas where enemies are chasing you while doing puzzles and when 30 seconds has gone by the enemies just disappear this is something the community asked for it and i updated the game and put it but again that's something that it's uh, only for this game and not something broad that can be applied to to all games so yeah i think we can probably we will come grab this for now i'm very happy you've been here listening to me and if you have any question I'm, i'll be more than glad to answer it so i hope you like it and see you in the next one bye ah and by the way i forgot i forgot totally forgot but thanks thanks so much uh to tara and ian for inviting me to making this talk it, means a lot for me and hope we can continue to collaborate in the in the future bye